Welcome to Lecture 3 on the Federal Bureaucracy. We left off discussing government corporations. Government corporations are the least understood organizations in the Federal Bureaucracy because they are intended to act more like a business than a traditional government department or agency. They generally have more freedom from the internal rules that control such agencies. They often have greater authority to hire and fire employees quickly and are allowed to make money through the sale of services such as train tickets, stamps, or home loans. For instance, government corporations cover a wide variety of policy issues. We have the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, or PBS, the U.S. Postal Service, Amtrak's, Federal National Mortgage Association, or Fannie Mae. Now, government corporations are supposed to turn a profit just like a private corporation, but in reality, they rarely succeed. Amtrak loses more than a billion dollars a year, for example, in large part because it operates a number of routes that generate little revenue. The bulk of its income comes from relatively short routes between large metropolitan areas such as Boston, New York, Philadelphia and Washington DC and a couple of scenic routes in the Northwest and through the Rocky Mountains. Now Amtrak's ridership has grown in recent years but its speed remains slow compared to government and private rail systems in other countries such as Japan. Even though it is a business it cannot make money unless it has the freedom to abandon unprofitable but politically protected routes. The U.S. Postal Service also has been losing money for decades. Although they made almost $70 billion in 2017 and increased its businesses shipping packages, it still lost almost $3 billion as first class mail volume has continued to decline. The different agencies of the executive branch can be classified into groups by the type of services that they provide to the American public. We have the promotion of national security, promotion of a strong economy, and promotion of the public welfare. We'll discuss each in turn. Vital agencies providing security for the United States are mostly located in state and local governments, such as the police. However, there are national security agencies that are really tasked into two groups, agencies that confront threats to internal national security and agencies to defend American society from external threats. Now, domestic security tasks changed drastically after 9-11. Prior to then, most national security efforts went into prosecuting federal crimes and the Department of Justice was charged with that task. However, after 9-11 terrorist attacks, the Department of Justice reoriented its activities aided by the U.S. Patriot Act, which gave them broad powers to detain foreigners suspected of posing threat. In the wake of 9-11, the federal government also created the Department of Homeland Security, signaling the high priority that domestic security had. In 2002, the Department of Homeland Security joined in domestic security efforts. However, the combined efforts between all of these departments brought into focus disputes of over who had the authority to do what. Now, external national security is maintained by the Department of State and the Department of Defense. The State Department's primary mission is diplomacy. It also supports the responsibilities of the Foreign Service officers who staff American embassies abroad. The DOD's original purpose was to unify the military departments into one national establishment, but that did not occur. Right now, the DOD is organized around their chain of command. At the top of the chain are the Chiefs of Staffs, collectively known as the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who direct military policy and management. In 2002, the Defense Department created the first command charged with Homeland Defense and Domestic Military Operations, the U.S. Northern Command. 
the 9-11 Commission's work prompted a major reorganization of the fragmented intelligence community, including creation of a new Director of National Intelligence. There are 17 offices or agencies dealing with internal intelligence gathering or external intelligence gathering. We have the Office of the Director of National Intelligence at the top, and I'll list them in descending order. The CIA, the National Security Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the FBI, the Department of State's Bureau of Intelligence and Research, the Department of Homeland Security Office of Intelligence and Analysis, the DEA or Drug Enforcement Administration, they have an Office of National Security Intelligence, the Department of Treasury has an intelligence office, Department of Energy, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the National Reconnaissance Office, Air Force Intelligence, Army Military Intelligence, Office of Naval Intelligence, Marine Corps Intelligence, and last but not least, the Coast Guard Intelligence. Now, the government does not run the American economy. However, it does conduct activities that are critical to maintaining a strong economy. The government activity relating to public finance is called fiscal policy. In the United States, we generally use the term fiscal policy to refer to government taxation and spending, and we use the term monetary policy to refer to policies about banks, credit, and currency. Now, the Treasury Department administers fiscal policy. It collects income, corporate, and other taxes. It prints currency. It manages the large national debt. Another important fiscal and monetary agency is the Federal Reserve System. It's a system of 12 banks that facilitates cash exchange, checks, and credit, regulates member banks, and uses monetary policies to fight things such as inflation and deflation. It has authority over the interest rates and lending activities of the nation's most important banks. Many other agencies work to strengthen other parts of the economy. We have the Agricultural Department that disseminates information on effective farming practices, and the Commerce Department's Small Business Administration that provides loans and technical assistance to small businesses across the country. For the public welfare, the bureaucracy promotes the public's welfare by enhancing or protecting the general well-being of its people. These agencies provide services build infrastructure, and enact regulations designed to enhance the well-being of the vast majority of citizens. The Department of Health and Human Services includes the National Institutes of Health, which conducts biomedical research. We have the Food and Drug Administration, which monitors the safety and efficacy of human and veterinary drugs, cosmetics, and the nation's food supply. We have the Centers, of Disease, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which seeks to protect public health and safety. Medicaid and Medicare both provide health insurance to low-income and elderly Americans. The Department of Agriculture's Food and Nutrition Service administers the Federal School Lunch Program and the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program known as SNAP, which was formerly known as food stamps. Location and structure. How do they matter? Well, most agencies are created by Congress, which decides whether to locate them with, within the executive branch or outside of it. Now, the president has greater control over organizations contained within the executive departments whereas independent agencies have more freedom from both the president and Congress. Now, in creating agencies, Congress also decides whether they will be headed by one person who reports to the president if the agency is in the executive branch or by a multi-person board like the independent agencies we talked about before. Now, let's talk about the merit system. The framers understood that the federal government would need employees and that many of these employees would stay with the government until they retired. The framers believed that these members 
of what now is called the civil service would outlive each administration, thereby maintaining the institutional memory of government. For the first hundred years, however, civil service were chosen mostly on the basis of party loyalty. President Andrew Jackson substantially expanded this to the victor goes the spoils system after his election in 1829. Jackson believed that every job in government was a potential opportunity for employing his political allies. His spoil system gave the president's parties complete control over almost every government job from cabinet secretaries down to post office clerks. Under this method of feeling jobs through political connections, presidents strengthened their control over the bureaucracy, but they sacrificed the expertise needed to execute the laws that Congress passed. After all, political allies are not necessarily skilled administrators. On July 2, 1881, however, President Garfield was assassinated by a man who was upset because he was not given a patronage job. This led to the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act of 1883, and with this act, the federal government attempted to Im imitate businesses by requiring bureaucratic personnel to be qualified for the jobs to which they were hired. The goal was to end the spoil system that dominated federal hiring. Covered positions must be obtained by passing an exam. Civil servants also cannot be fired without cause. This began a slow but steady transfer of federal jobs from the patronage system to the merit system. We will end lecture three there and review questions.